Dean Schwartz really teed this up so beautifully for all of the panels today in his description of the components of a scientific revolution, the need and the opportunity with new data, new technology, new empiricism, and a, a new, uh, new demands, new challenges. And you've really heard through the different lenses of our panels how they are anchored across those themes. And um, it is really that which our next and second keynote speaker is going to help us reflect on and uh, kind of bring home. So I am so thrilled to be able to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is a brilliant neuroscientist. Uh, as I'm learning to know him, he's really an incredible human being and someone who we're very excited to call now one of Stanford's own, uh, Phil Fisher. We are lucky that he has recently relocated to Stanford to build out our new center on early childhood. Nothing could make this pediatrician's heart happier. His work on uh, advancing impact for young children and families is anchored in equity and in uh, developing partnerships with the communities, which again, as someone who's out there a lot, I couldn't be more excited about. His work to develop and launch the rapid assessment of the pandemic's impact on development and early childhood survey was unbelievably timely, responsive, and incredibly illuminating. You probably read about it multiple times in the New York Times. Um, quite simply, this survey has changed the way we garner and act on data from children and families. Just one example of his brilliance. Please join me in welcoming D Bill Fisher. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for sticking around through this last panel. Um, I'm going to begin with just some reflections on some of what I've heard today. I have some prepared remarks that I'll get to following that. I, I think first, one of the themes that's come through so much of what we heard today is that learning occurs in an environment of relationships. I think historically we've thought about education as focusing on the child or the, the person who's engaged in the education environment. But so much of what we're seeing, not just through the science, but also through the programs that have been highlighted, is the extent to which relationships are really where that learning is cultivated. The interactions between adults and children, between children and other children, are really where that happens. The second reflection that I have is really about how systems, if we zoom out further, systems are really critical to understand how we can promote optimal learning. Systems are important because systems are where many of the inequities lie structurally. Um, and so if we want to make progress, we really need to think about these systemic inequalities and how to address them. But also, as we heard from Lisa and many others, it's really in the alignment of different systems in which learners are engaged that we can see some of the most transformative work happening. I think the examples of healthcare and education and how we're starting to see models of how Healthcare can be th thought of as a place where learning is promoted, but also where we can think more holistically about things like housing and legal services, all of these things coming together to really provide the support that learners need. And, and then third, I think one of the things that's come through so clearly is that if we're really centering on learning, then moving away from the idea of curriculum as the way in which we learn and really thinking much more about individuals and about variation is really where we should be headed in terms of the sort of where the field is going. So that's sort of sum, summing up some of what we've heard today. I also, I keep thinking about Bruce McCandless' statement that we're all billionaires, which I thought was, was lovely. And at the same time, I was also thinking in part because of some of the survey work that we've done during the pandemic, that I wish we could spend our neurons on things like food and housing and things like that. Because we know that, uh, that, again, not being able to access basic needs and basic resources is a huge potential impediment to learning. So I just want, want to start with that. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, by, by talking a little bit about just circling back to what Dean Schwartz began the day with, which is this idea that we're really on the cusp of a, of a new scientific revolution, and that that's not just impacting things like how we treat and identify the causes of diseases or being able to look far out into space to, to understand the origins of the universe and our, our solar system and our planet, but it's really also having an impact on the very broad and diverse discipline of education. 
Uh, I, I think really simply in the past several decades, we've really uh, gotten to a place where science can allow us to understand how learning occurs across the lifespan that the very early learning that occurs in the context of families is one place that we should be thinking about. Uh, but as children enter preschool and school uh, and, and enter higher education, and even adults and into old age, that learning is something that occurs across the, across the lifespan, and that really all of the knowledge that's coming uh, to us really needs to be extended across that entire continuum. I think what this means is that where education has ex historically kind of been a black box, where we kind of made our best efforts uh, to kind of put uh, resources into things that facilitated children's ability to learn to read, to do math, and to become productive members of society, uh, that we can now be much more precise. You heard about this from Pat Cool's comments, from Bruce McCandless's comments and others, about how the brain develops in ways that can really understand how learning occurs across the lifespan. And so we're really kind of getting beyond these black box models to understand what's inside them. This is important because it's not just simply good enough for science to, to be able to document how things work, uh, but then that knowledge can be deployed for us to be able to design strategies, and you heard about some of these today, that have the greatest potential to really promote outcomes, positive outcomes, uh, for all individuals across all kinds of income levels and circumstances, and in all countries around the world. I think also such knowledge, and we heard about this uh, sort of consistently across the day, really the knowledge also holds the promise of allowing us to mitigate uh, some of the risks to optimal development that occur because of things like gender inequity, lack of resources, other kinds of social factors. Uh, and really, in this way, we can begin to narrow achievement gaps that have been well documented. Sean Reardon here at the GSE has done a tremendous amount of work on this. Uh, achievement gaps that exist because of structural and systemic inequalities that have only been growing in many places in recent years. I think this is especially important right now as we, hopefully, I'm gonna knock wood here, emerge from the, from the global pandemic uh, because we are coming out of a time when there have been tremendous disruptions to early learning and learning environments in general. Uh, we've also been facing time, a time of, of tremendous unpredictability and uncertainty. And there is a great deal of science, neuroscience and uh, developmental psychology that shows that uncertainty is not, especially when it's, it's consistent and long-term chronic unpredictability, does not create optimal developmental conditions. And so uh, we can see in some of the data that's starting to emerge that there has been, among some individuals, tremendous learning loss that's occurred over this time in ways that some of the progress that we were starting to see coming out of, of the, the science of education has really been eroded. I think uh, we're not just talking about, however, kind of the period that we're coming out of, because the world continues to be facing conditions of uncertainty that are due to things like geopolitical conflicts and climate. And so we really need to continue to think about how the, the, this revolution that's occurring can really uh, come to address what we're coming to see as more of the new normal that children and families are facing. Just one example from our own work of how science can be applied, and I think this relates again to some of, the, some of what we heard about today. Uh, so my, my colleagues and I have for many years studied children reared in very neglectful environments that include families involved in the foster care system, children reared in institutional settings in other countries. And one of the things that we found when we bring these children into the laboratory is that when they're completing tasks and they make mistakes, when, when we give them feedback that they've made those mistakes, we actually see quite limited neural response to the mistakes that they're making. It's almost as if the information is just simply not getting through. I want to be clear that probably in the context of very unpredictable and non-responsive environments, that's a very healthy and adaptive response. If the world isn't kind of giving much to you, then it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to pay attention to the information that's coming in. But it also creates tr tremendous challenges as we see when these children enter the formal school system and struggle not only academically, but in terms of social emotional learning. 
understanding that this might be tied to a diminished neural response to information coming in has allowed us to very specifically design programs that target those exact mechanisms. And it's not rocket science, just like Dennis Wall was talking about in terms of the Google Glass approach. Sometimes very straightforward strategies, like making signals much more clear to children, are enough to activate the brain's plasticity and to really turn things around. So when we have kids in these kinds of contexts, where there is this kind of information that's much more readily available, not only do we see them perform better in terms of their social and academic achievement, but we actually see much more typical brain response than occurring, an indication of the brain's plasticity uh, in response to kind of these changes in their environmental context. So I think the potential is great, but as we've heard repeatedly today, there's also tremendous variation in our genetic makeup uh, that means that there is vast difference in how learning and knowledge is acquired that's built into our very genetic blueprints and then is further kind of made variable by the experiences that we have over the course of the lifespan, what people talk about in terms of ep epigenetics. And I think one of the reasons that this is important is that the science really needs to increasingly move, not just from a perspective of what works, but what works for whom, to be able to really incorporate the kind of variation that we might see uh, in typical learning environments. And I think one example of this uh, that we talked about was the Google, Google Glass kind of approach. But I also think it's not just about helping children adapt uh, based on their variation, but also things like helping teachers become more able to deal with learning difficult, difficulties through, or different differences through things like virtual reality, being able to see the world through, a child, through the eyes of a child who might have divergent kind of approaches to learning. And of course, we're not just talking about learning occurring in academic settings, in schools and, and preschools and higher education. We know that learning occurs uh, in all environments, that learning can occur in built environments and the natural environment. It's also possible to leverage places like laundromats and, and doctor's offices and create ample experiences for kids to gain learning in those kinds of contexts. Uh, I also want to emphasize, and you'll hear some of this on this next panel, I think this has not come out enough today, that we're not just talking about learning that begins very early in life and ends when children complete or adults complete their higher education or graduate degrees. Learning is a lifelong process, and we can think about learning in terms of workforce, in terms of older adults, and the strategies that are most effective there, and I think that's super critical. But I want to circle back to some of the, the sort of the, the opportunities and the challenges that Dean Schwartz alluded to in his opening comments. I think that science has tremendous potential, and Lisa alluded to some of the areas where we're seeing some of that potential really occur. At the same time, I think one of the things that science has really struggled with is great in understanding sort of what the underlying mechanisms are and potentially in using research to design effective strategies. But where we've really not, not done nearly as well is in the dissemination of knowledge and ideas in contexts where it can really be most useful. So the idea of how do ideas get that out there is a recurring theme that's come out today. And I see it as something that really is part of this next revolution is how we're going to get there. I don't think it's, as people have alluded to, just good ideas parachuting or helicoptering in I think there are other approaches that are really critical uh, to employ in order to make sure that ideas get out there. And I want to note, as somebody said earlier today, scale is not just about ideas going big. If the ideas don't make a difference, then scaling is not, is not going to be as effective. The other thing is scale doesn't have to mean global. Scale could mean that everybody in a particular context, whether it's a community or a county or a state or a country, uh, is, is not deprived of access to the most optimal kinds of learning environments. I think uh, where researchers maybe have struggled in getting their ideas out there, given that we're in the heart of Silicon Valley, I can say that there's sort of, an, an, in some of the innovation sector, some equal challenges on the opposite side, which is a lot of innovators are great at thinking about how ideas can scale, but don't have the, the tools necessary to think about 
how to have the greatest impact. And I think we need to stop thinking about research as just a tool for proving that something works, but rather take our nod from industry and think about how research can allow for continuous improvement idea, of ideas and of technology so that we can continue to be much more personalized in our approaches. Where should we look to for in inspiration? I think this very conference tells us where we should be looking. First of all, in numerous place-based initiatives around the world, there are a number of individuals and organizations who are really reinventing the way education occurs in order to more adequately meet the needs of all children. And I think the Edan Prize Foundation um, has celebrated through their laureates a number of such individuals and organizations. We've heard about Brock and how starting in Bangladesh and then expanding further into Asia and Africa, that right now there are over 100,000 children who are enrolled in play labs and over 14 million students who've, who've been engaged in the, the kinds of classrooms uh, that Brock supports. Uh, we know from Vicki Colbert's uh, work and, and her organization is, is uh, Escuela Nueva, uh, that we can bring education uh, to contexts very broadly that have not had access to quality education. And I think we can see this happening in numerous other instances where we're helping to address gender inequities through education and so forth. Taking all of these examples to heart, which I think are in extremely important to do, I think we really need to imagine a world in which science and innovation are really coming together to produce unprecedented impacts uh, and scale that we have not seen before. And I think in order to achieve this, and this is one of the things that I think a gathering like this can do uh, today, is to really create spaces in which science and the ideas that it brings with us and uh, innovation can really flow together in order to accelerate the transformation in education. I also think, and we heard this theme consistently, that this isn't just about governments, it's not just about researchers, and it's not just about organizations. That key in the design process is the very people who are the recipients, the end users, and the practitioners of education. And that if we simply keep thinking about how to put things in place rather than how to engage communities, that we'll really end up feeling like we're depriving ourselves of the full potential. So I think, put simply, the revolution in science will have greatly diminished impact uh, especially at a time when it's most needed if we don't develop tools that allow us to work together synergistically and effectively. And I really hope that everybody here will kind of take that challenge seriously and move forward together so that we're, we're really creating a new theory of change. And that theory of change is really about how all of these different pieces come together. I think we're on the cusp of being able to do that and I think we need to go forth from here and really make it happen. Thank you so much, as good as we had anticipated. Um, all right, so please help me welcome someone who does not need any introduction. Uh, the director of the Hoover Institution here at Stanford and the 66th United States Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice. We are fortunate uh, that the panelists who will be joining uh, Dr. Rice on stage represent a tremendous cross-sector uh, expertise. We have higher education, people from the nonprofit, technology, philanthropy, and policy backgrounds. This group is intentionally diverse. As you heard President Tessier Levine and Dean Schwartz share earlier today, it is incumbent upon us to energize collaborations that span both disciplines and industries if we are truly to energize the potential of all learners. And these are indisputably the individuals whose work exemplifies the potential for our path ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, the School of Education and Dean Schwartz. Thank you very much for having us all here. Uh, the way that we're going to proceed is that um, we have some questions for my fellow panelists. Um, at some point, I am going to turn to some questions from those who are streaming, but also there are microphones uh, in the uh, aisles for those of you who wish to have a question. And remember, I'm a professor. If nobody raises their hand, I will call on somebody. I do cold call in my classes. Um, I'm delighted to be joined uh, on the stage by uh, Vicki Colbert, the founder and director of New School Foundation, Columbia. 
uh, John Hennessy, Stanford's 10th president, um, the chairman of Alphabet Incorporated, and also the director of our innovative Knight Hennessy Fellowship Program. Uh, Saul Khan, the founder and CEO of Khan Academies. Brooke Stafford Broussard, the Vice President for Research to Practice uh, of Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and Candace Till, the Director of Learning Science Amazon. And so this is a great panel. And I'm going to start by reflecting uh, on something that Phil said and, and using that to, to get our panel started. Uh, it was a, a very striking comment uh, that we're on the cusp of a new scientific revolution. Uh, that we are perhaps at a moment where science can really make a difference in how we think about learning, how we think about restructuring uh, the process of learning. And so I'm going to be a bit provocative and I'm going to ask uh, John and then Candace. Uh, we have long thought that technology might be uh, an answer to our uh, concerns about education. Uh, we appreciate the need for an interdisciplinary approach. Why haven't we made more progress? Mm. John, why don't you start? Well, I think because it's a much harder problem than we understood in the beginning. I still remember when we put the first MOOC up from my colleagues in computer science. But by the way, first they put it up and they said anybody in the world can register for this course. And then they told the provost and president they were doing this. <laughs> but we made it all work. Uh, but what we discovered when we had 10,000 people taking machine learning course designed for Stanford students is that eight or 9,000 of them couldn't keep up with the pace, didn't have the prerequisites. So that was the first thing. The second thing we discovered was people learn in different ways. And in fact, it was Dean Schwartz who I asked about this who told me not all learners learn the same way. And just putting material up, putting content up wasn't enough. The third challenge we've had, I think, is that it's really hard to do experiments in the education sector. You know, Google experiments with how search works and how they place ads every single day. But doing an experiment with somebody else's children, first of all, that creates a certain hurdle you have to overcome. And then you do the experiment and then wait five years to see whether or not they really, you really taught them new material and they succeeded and things. So though all those things have, have made it harder than we thought. Although I think as Phil said in his talk, as we understand more about neuroscience, more about the process of learning and how different people learn, we can reflect that back and build systems that are more adaptive rather than the initial cut. Yeah. Candice, you want to add on to that? Sure. Um, so uh, your question was, why hasn't technology solved the problem for us? Well, um, in a, in a in something something like word, that. something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. And I think uh, John made some great comments about how we've used technology to help make traction on solving the problem. Most people thought the big power of technology in solving the problem was access. That the real problem was, and this is what MOOCs really attempted to solve, the real problem is the education's fine, just it's unequal access. Uh, so the idea behind MOOCs was we create the access, the problem will be solved. Uh, obviously that didn't work for the reasons that John uh, listed, but we forgot some of the other real powers of the technology. One of the ones uh, that Dan mentioned this morning that makes this revolution possible is data. Mm -hmm. The power of this technology is not just pushing it out, but pushing it to an interface where we can observe the learner. And in this case, it means collecting the data from the learner's actions so we can get better insight into what are the mechanisms of human learning. And I would say the third thing that people don't talk enough about is that uh, to really understand human learning, we need to understand features about the learner, features about the thing being learned, and features about the context in which that learning is occurring. And to be able to look at each of those features and how they interact, to be able to support an instructional differentiation decision at the time scale we need to do that, that's beyond human cognition. But it's not beyond the power of our algorithms to help support us in making those decisions. So it hasn't done it yet, but by leveraging the things that Dean Schwartz spoke to this morning, it is the only thing that will enable us to make these changes. It's 
So we're, we're getting there? We are definitely getting there. All right, All right. I'll, I'll take that. We'll come back in 10 years and ask the question again. <laughs> so uh, let, let me turn uh, for a moment on this question of access. And uh, people talk a lot about access. They also talk about the need uh, to scale in order to create access. But I thought it was very interesting that uh, Phil warned us about this concept of scale as not being uh, the panacea. So uh, let me ask um, uh, Vicki and Saul. Vicki, uh, we have an uneven an distribution of uh, educational benefits in the US uh, and across the world. 85% uh, of young people in the world are going to be in Africa and Asia in the next 20 years. The question is how is the system reaching them? Uh, we have a lot of experiments. Are they adding up to much? How do we scale? And I think that uh, both of you have dealt with this issue of scale. So Vicki, can I turn to you first? Well, first of all, uh, I have to say something about Escuela Nueva because it was a local innovation that started in Colombia and it became a national policy impacting more than 20,000 schools. Uh, and um, it has inspired many educational reforms worldwide. Uh, going up, not only Latin American and, and Caribbean, but mainly to Vietnam and getting in places where they have implemented it. Uh, it's one of the longest bottom-up innovation, bottom innovations of the developing world that's still being sustained, despite that innovations are very vulnerable to political and administrative changes. We'll talk at the end about the role of public, private, and civil society. But it's an example of how innovations, you know, for us, necessity was the mother of innovation. And Escuela Nueva is not new in the philosophy of education. It just puts in practice what we know 100 years ago, what John Dewey, what Maria Montessori, what Vygotsky, you know, nothing new in the philosophy of education. So what does it do? It promotes child-centered, nothing new in the philosophy, child-centered, active participatory, uh, per active participation, uh, a new role of the teacher for the 21st century and the participation of parents. We had to think systemically from the beginning. That's important because we want, because the school and rise became a local innovation, then it became a national policy. So definitely, by the way, necessity is the mother of innovation. You know? mm -hmm. And Charles Leadbeater in, in the UK, he talks about innovations coming from the margins of society. So every, nothing worked, uh, so we just had to rethink everything. We started with those invisible rural multi-grade schools, but that's the beauty of it, because precisely in these schools, you, teachers have to handle heter heterogeneity, how, how do you say it in English? Heterogeneidad, <laughs> no? Because they're different children, different learning rhythms in the classroom. So it promotes self-paced learning. We have to incorporate personalized learning. We had to start cooperative learning because we have learned that children learn through dialogue and interaction. Nothing new in the philosophy of education. A new role of the teacher for, you know, for the future instead of a, 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 a transmitter of facts and information. So uh, I think for, we, we concentrated more on the house, you know, on the house, uh, because we had to think that anything we did was feasibly uh, politically Technically speaking, that any teacher could do it because you cannot find a PhD in the middle of the jungle of Colombia. <laughs> no? So we had to think of all these things that was feasible technically. Politically, we have strong unions in Latin America. So you have to make sure that the teachers are the agents of change. No? So technical, political, and financially, cost effectiveness. We, if you want to impact national policy, you have to be cost effective. <laughs> no? So we had to think it very systemically from the, from the beginning. Yeah. And uh, just a question on uh, the political side of it. You said you, you had to have it adopted. When did you feel that you had a breakthrough? Was there a moment at which you thought, well, this is actually going to be national policy now? Is this going to scale? Was it legislation? Was it uh, the rising up of groups who were uh, prepared to support it? Uh, I sometimes think that the politics is the hardest part of <laughs> education. Yeah, that's <laughs> the hardest part. <laughs> yeah, we had to transform all this complexity into simple, manageable action. We had to concentrate on the house. You know? 
because we know the, 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 what, the what, but more, not so much the hows. Uh, so we really had to think that anything we did was really could impact national policy. And of course, we started as a local innovation, became a national policy. And um, so I think one of the most, let's say, I ended up, as a local innovator, I ended up being a Biden Minister of Education in Colombia in some moment, and uh, we took it to scale. I had already done all the work bottom up, <laughs> but I had this possibility. So I think this was very important because then we, we, we took it to scale, and, uh, and definitely, we, we, we started learning after I became vice minister. I said, no, this is not going to be sustained. You have to work with the private sector and with civil society. So, you know, I, I learned the hard way. But that's something that has been so important for us because you have to work with governments if you want to have impact and coverage, and that's tough. But you need the role of public-private partnerships and the role of civil society for two words, <laughs> quality and sustainability. That's why it's one of the longest bottom-up innovations that's still being sustained. So you need that. But uh, I, I can talk forever, so you, I'm, a, I'm a Latin, so you also have to tell me. <laughs> okay. That's great. We've learned a lot. So Saul, you, you took on the issue of scale in a different way. Uh, talk about your uh, initial experiment and then how it really has become a, a go-to for so many, many people. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Folks are probably reasonably uh, familiar with Khan Academy. It all started as a tutoring project with my cousins. I started writing software for them, made videos for them, took on a life of its own, quit my day job uh, in, in finance at the time, and then you know, been on a journey ever since. We have, I think, 140 million registered users. The, the, um, you know, I think the, the interesting question here is, if you think about the whole pipeline, first you have to have some type of thing that's accessible, then people have to be aware of it, then they have to engage in it, and then that engagement has to actually be efficacious. And to your first question, I actually think there's a ton of efficacious interventions that exist. Um, and we're not the only one. I think we have certain scale properties to your question that, that, that may, maybe are, are, are interesting. But we just had, you know, we've had 50 plus efficacy studies. And I know we're not the only thing like this, but we just had one. If students are able to put in 30 minutes a week over a school year, they're growing 50% more than the students who aren't doing it. And it, it might seem kind of magical, 30 minutes a week in, in math, and your students are spending roughly five to 10 hours in math, how does that make such a big difference? Well, it's exactly what Vicky was saying. Most students in most math classes, but it happens in every math, in, in every classroom, they are disengaged, they're not learning something in their learning edge, their zone of proximal development. It's, it's not mastery-based. You have a gap in something, you move on to the next thing, and no one addresses that last one. It's not personalized. It might take some of us a little bit more time to learn one thing or another. So even just 30 minutes a week dramatically accelerates students, and it actually keeps going. If you do an hour a week, it, it takes two hours a week. The reason why we don't, I don't even talk about an hour a week is that uh, the question is, it's, why haven't we been able to get more people to engage at even the 30 minutes a week? Mm -hmm. The tools like MOOCs or Khan Academy, there's others, they're, they're incredibly accessible. Um, awareness, I think, is part of the problem. Uh, even though we exist to, uh, to address inequity, to reach the kids who have nothing, to be kind of a, a strategic education reserve, to be a safety net, it, it's adopted in many cases by you know, all of us and, 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 and all of our families. So we, we have to think about how do we actually get awareness to the folks. In, in a lot of the world, they have devices, they have ways of, uh, and there is still a digital divide, but that's changing fast. But I think the engagement is the ultimate question. And there's things that we do on our side, on let's say the technology and the tool side of it. Can we make it more gamified? Can we make it so that kids really want to do it? Uh, you know, we're, we just introduced a free tutoring aspect on schoolhouse.world, and the way we scale tutoring is by leveraging peer-based tutoring, mm -hmm. but we vet the students, the, the tutors, in a really scalable uh, and we think rigorous way. But the, the real key is how do we, uh, you know, we, we talk about politics, there is just an inertia in a school system. The reason why I don't say even an hour or two hours where we could grow the students 200% or, or something is it, it's just a different mindset. Even getting that 30 minutes of a five hours of a, of a school week it's taking a little bit of time. And you know, the results we're seeing, they, they don't, some people, and I was originally skeptical, I was like, oh, well, that must correlate with just the kids who want to do it. But it's actually not correlating with kid performance in terms of dosage. It's correlating with what the school decides to do. Mm. 
And even though schools don't correlate with income or anything else, it's really, is there the will? And can we simplify the implementation model enough? So you know, I think the name of the game for the next 10 years, obviously we'll improve, everyone will improve things that are efficacious, we'll have more things that scale and are accessible, but how do you get people to really engage? Yeah, very interesting. Um, a lot of what we've talked about is uh, taking experiments, uh, trying to, to push them forward. But we're also sitting here in a great research university and there are many great places for research. Um, Sometimes, at least I feel, that there's a gap between what the researchers are doing and what practitioners uh, have uh, access to, uh, understand, the, the interaction between researchers and practitioners. And I think uh, if anyone knows that well, Brooke, you know it well, because you've uh, spent a lot of time trying to think about get, uh, closing that gap between researchers and practitioners so that they work more effectively together and I would say that the synergies between them should then push things forward more quickly than if they worked in silos. So can you talk about that sure, uh, perspective? Sure. And Saul set, set me up very well because it's really all about implementation, right? And exactly. um, I mean, I'll reinforce so much of what we've heard today that um, education is human development. Human development is multidisciplinary because it exactly. all converges in us, right? Um, but our education system is not multidisciplinary uh, because it was designed and um, has been delivered uh, over many, many years. And these, these fields of science have emerged since. And um, because of that, we have really problematic contradictions to what many of the scholars and researchers have shared with us today. You know, discipline is an example. Um, we know that if a child demonstrates a behavior, whether in childhood or adolescence, it's often, often kind of signification of, of a developmental need. Um, but in our education system, we exclude, we isolate, uh, we remove. Um, when people like Pat Cool will teach us that it's about co-regulation, it's about connecting. Um, and so if we want to bring uh, all of these sciences into um, effective, feasible, scalable, sustainable practice, we really do have to move to bridge that gap and uh, design deep and, and balanced uh, research practice partnerships. And I say balanced because um, I think Carol Dweck, with beautiful humility, named it this morning. Like, we are all pieces of a puzzle in these partnerships, right? Um, and deep expertise is required from every individual in the partnership. Um, and so we cannot move this work into practice without the expertise of the researcher and their knowledge base, without the expertise of the school teacher, school leader, school superintendent, and their expertise around the complex environment that we're trying to implement this work in, and without the expertise of, of community and family and students uh, who, are, who we're working to serve. Um, and so uh, I think, again, Carol kind of really gave us a great example. Like the, what we're learning um, in, in the, these fields um, is not going to be implemented with a simple intervention, right? It's one thing to support a child to understand that uh, they get smarter with effort, but if they move back into an, a school where smart kids are celebrated on the walls and a teacher through kind of just implicit behaviors is reinforcing a fixed mindset, then that impact of the intervention isn't sustained. And so researchers working with school practitioners who deeply understand how to design those complex environments is what is going to get us to a uh, broader scale of, of these evidence-based practices, whether it's through technology or, or policy. Do you, do you ever find that uh, practitioners, <coughs> teachers, principals, simply say, I, enough, I, I have so much on my plate. Uh, don't tell me to change the way that I was taught to do this. I'm just trying to keep my head above water here. And I wonder sometimes if that's one of the problems with, uh, with implementation. Vicki, I think you had your finger up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, please, yes. I was saying that's the point. That's yeah. a very yes, clear yeah. point. Why interdisciplinary in a way? We had to think systemically from the beginning. And uh, you know, academic and non-academic dimensions. Uh, and, uh, and we had to think of systemically it meant four components. Curriculum, mm. child-centered, teacher training, uh, relationship, relationships between the school and the community and the parents. So we have all these four components, and necessarily, you, 
uh, you have to have be inspired in, in, in previous research, but it's just putting research into yeah. practice. And so it is that, not. That, that was one of the things. For us, it was so important to have decades of research behind. Um, and you know, not only an academic achievement, you know, when UNESCO did the first study, comparative international study in Latin America, Colombia and Cuba were the only two countries where rural schools outperformed urban schools, except for the mega cities, compensated for social e inequality. So we had to focus on quality, inequality, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and this was the future of learning, because in a way, it's like the story of Cinderella, you know, because education systems, are slower than the rest of society. Mm -hmm. And in Latin America, everybody's just learning administrative issues, how to manage educational systems and learn how to decentralize. And they forgot the pedagogy. Mm -hmm. you know? So for us, it was so crucial to take the school as the unit of change. You know? And mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. bottom up, the bottom up. Yes. to demonstrate that, yes, it can be done. Yeah. And, but always research behind. I'm originally a sociologist, so yes. I know that uh, I'm not a researcher, but I know that you have to have research behind and uh, if you want to reach national policy yeah. and to survive because, you know, innovations are very vulnerable to political and administrative changes. So, yeah. I think so. Yes. It's a long time. Gonna ask, yeah, I, I would also note, and we've heard it through the day, that we, we shouldn't put the, the challenges of a system on the shoulders of a student or a teacher, right? Mm -hmm. and, and teachers, uh, we don't train teachers through the lens of human development uh, across, you know, teacher preparation at scale. Um, you know, schools like Stanford will lead the way in kind of making that uh, that shift. But we have to um, design like, intentional, structured, scaled opportunities for teachers to learn. Again, many of the the um, learnings and, and findings from the sciences that we heard today and. If we do put it on the shoulders of the individual, it can it can be very dangerous and it can create spaces of, of harm. You know, if you take an example of, of what Phil shared, for example, um, incredibly compelling research on the impact of neglect. But if you, without like deep understanding of all the nuances that that are part of that research, kind of leave that space, um, and we've heard the the threats and, and dangers of a deficit mindset today, you might hear. You know, a student who is neglected is going to show up this way in the classroom, and it can translate, again, in the most dangerous spaces to, like, broken brain, broken kid, right? Instead of understanding that the context of neglect created that space, the brain is responding, and Phil named this, in a way that is protecting that child, that the brain is malleable, and through the environments that we build that are consistent and predictable and loving, you can address the needs of that child. Um, and even if the teacher has that knowledge base and is handed an, an evidence-based practice, um, school leadership, system leadership, has to create the organizational supports to be able to implement that practice and to get the coaching and the feedback that, that is necessary to develop expertise. And so that's, that's on the system, not the teacher. Yeah. I, I'm gonna close with a question to our panel and then I have a few questions from the live stream, but also if there are those of you who wish to ask questions at the microphone, you might prepare to do that. So I think one thing that's gotten everybody's attention about uh, education is what's happened to us over the last couple of years with the global pan pandemic. Uh, you hear about learning loss, you uh, hear about the strains and stresses, uh, not just on families but on the children, not to mention on systems. Talk a little bit about uh, what we've seen and how we, how we right the ship because there's a sense that uh, with all that education was going through, this was the last thing we needed. Uh, it's, it's all, maybe you want to start that comment. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not telling anyone anything they don't know. The pandemic was hard, not just academically, but socially, emotionally on everyone, but especially kids in, you know, historically under-resourced communities globally. Uh, I, I think what's interesting is that everyone is now talking about learning loss and unfinished learning, but it's not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, before the pandemic, depending on how you look at it, 40, 50% of kids going to four-year colleges, when they, when they go and they take the placement test at the, at the college, these are the top half of kids who actually graduate from high school, decide to go to college, either a two-year or four-year college. The colleges are saying, it's the first time that mastery learning is being enforced in their life. Mm -hmm. And the colleges are saying, hey, wait, you're not even ready to learn college algebra, which honestly should be a remedial class. You're not even ready to learn college algebra. We're gonna take you back to essentially seventh grade math. 
So the whole system is just going through the motion, seventh grade, eighth grade, algebra one, algebra two, and it's happening in other subjects too. It's just, it's just most pronounced there. That was pre-pandemic. It's just gotten uh, that much worse. The silver lining is people are actually talking about it now. I don't think they're, they're completely clear on what to do, but the solutions are there. People are, are now, they're almost going from everyone learn at the same pace in a kind of traditional industrial model to, oh, maybe everyone needs tutoring now because there was all of these mm -hmm. federal dollars and once again, with the tutoring, and if you, if you ask any district official now, uh, even when there's free tutoring available, there's, it's an engagement problem. People aren't actually showing up for the free tutoring. That's, that's kind of the dirty secret that's been going on right now. And so like, well, how, do, how do we do this? And the solution is there's many tools, interventions, obviously we're one of them, where you can allow students to learn at their own time and pace, master concepts, get that mastery, Credit recovery, this is something, you know, uh, kind of Lisa was uh, talking to me earlier about how we experienced the pandemic. We, we did see an immediate spike. We went from about 30 million learning minutes a day to about 90 minute, million learning minutes a day. But I think the most significant thing for us is it was a bit of a kick in the pants that we can't wait a decade or two decades to start seeing if we can create a, a safety net for the world. In some ways, we, we played some of that role in certain subjects. So, you know, for us, is how do we cover more subjects and grades faster? How can we give high school and college credit for work on Khan Academy? That will be coming soon. We're already doing a pilot with Howard University where college algebra, kids in Title I schools get mastery on Khan Academy, they get transferable college algebra credit from Howard University. But if it works for, co for, for college algebra, why can't it work for pre-calculus, calculus, biology, chemistry, physics, I can keep going, history. Um, to a world where why can't we in the next five or 10 years give anyone on the planet a free college education and then have that place into apprenticeships at uh, employers or internships at employers and just make it a really clear, accessible and affordable uh, pathway to, to whatever uh, li life folks want. So I think the pandemic, a lot of problems, but it's also been a good kick in the pants. And I know we're not the only one. I think it, probably everyone in this room, it, it gave us a little bit of, little bit of energy. Great. Any other comments on pandemic? Well, I think Saul yeah. said the key word. Yeah. It's engagement, right? It's yeah. not just technology. It's not just video. It's not just something you watch on your screen. And the pandemic really caused us to realize how much that engagement in the classroom, students learning from other students, really matters. So that whole process, whether it's tutoring otherwise, and I think, I think Saul's right. We should be better prepared next time because we should have learned from this lesson the loss that we've incurred. And just as we need to prepare ourselves in public health, we need to prepare ourselves in the rest of the public infrastructure that supports young people. And, and I would just note, it's not just K-12. This, no. this is an issue for higher education exactly. as well, uh, exactly. because we had to turn on a dime in higher education, and I don't know that we did it all that well. Uh, it's, a little e it's a little easier when you're talking to Stanford students. They have a slightly higher motivation level, I think. Uh, but well, even the maybe. Maybe we lost, we lost, yeah, we something. lost something. We lost something. something. There's no yeah. doubt about yeah. it. Right. Uh, also, I just yes. want to say yes. um, engagement is important, but not just any engagement. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think right. this was the mistake we made when we went from don't be a sage on a stage, learn by doing. Then everyone started saying, okay, let's make the students do stuff. Uh, but learn by doing isn't the answer either because you're always learning. It's are you learning what it is that we want you to learn or that you want to learn. So really thinking about not just engagement or just doing, but getting really at the mechanisms of what kind of engagement or what kind of doing will stimulate yeah. the learning processes we're yeah. trying to stimulate to help you build the knowledge and capabilities you're building. And that's where we, we really need to bring much more of the science in uh, to really understand what are the mechanisms so that we are designing and doing science at the same time. Yes. We don't have connectivity in the rural areas right. of Colombia, like the rest of Latin America. But I think the COVID situation, I think it was good for us because it forced us first, child-centered, <laughs> what we've been saying for so many years, mm -hmm. and it forced, to be, you know, it forced the child to be the center of learning. It forced the parents to come into the picture. It forced the change of the role of the teacher that we're talking about, not as a transmitter of instruction, uh, as a, a facilitator, uh, you know, a mentor, a more profound dimension of the teacher. So in a way, it was good for us. Now, um, the interesting thing is in, there are no rural, uh, in rural, uh, we don't have connectivity. The teachers do live in the smaller towns, and there there is connectivity. And we had uh, something that we call Renueva as a virtual campus 
we started some uh, years ago. But then uh, with the pandemic, it was amazing to see we're reaching thousands of teachers in the most remote areas of Colombia through our virtual campus. And here we need a lot of technological help. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. but, uh, but, I, I, but you could do it. And, and the teachers went to the schools and they looked for their uh, printed learning materials, learn, learning guides. Because the, our learning guides have a little, a little special thing. You know, we wanted to incorporate higher level thinking skills and application of knowledge in family and in community. So this was, this was important. And as it's good pedagogy, we also right now, we adapted it to urban marginal and to migrant populations. So for example, we're working in six cities of Colombia right now with Venezuelans because we have two million migrants in Colombia. So we have to handle, you know, how can we bridge and bring them into the education system? So we created the concept of a Escuela Now Learning Circles, you know, which, uh, uh, are community-based and there's a teacher or a tutor working with maximum 12, 15 children, giving them love, personalized attention, you know, strengthening their self-esteem. By the way, we have measured all these dimensions of social and emotional aspects, mm -hmm. which are so important. So I think we, I mean, necessity is the mother of innovation, yeah. so we were first sure. to do it. <laughs> and we were first to think systemically from the beginning. I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned uh, the Venezuelan migrant kids um, are, and uh, re kids in refugee circumstances are some of the most difficult circumstances for learning. And um, it's something uh, I would love to see us pay more attention to. Uh, watched it in many places. Uh, we're going to turn to some questions uh, that are on the live stream, and then we'll go to uh, some from the audience. But I'm going get to get one here that's a pretty basic. It says, uh, academic excellence is often measured by Samarit, uh, summative assessment. Rote learning is much encouraged. Students come out with first class honors, but cannot solve <laughs> basic societal problems. We produce mechanical engineers who can't fix a basic automobile. So the, I think the question is about um, the, what is it that we're actually teaching? And maybe since you look at data, uh, and there is a question for you about data, can you give us some examples? So I'll merge those two questions and turn to you. Um, so some examples. Well, I'll, I'll first start off by saying I think Dean Schwartz made the point this morning that uh, with the explosion of knowledge and how it's being created constantly, that mastery can't be the goal of education anymore. Uh, what we really have to do is support people to learn how to continuously learn and upskill. And now I'll connect it to my current role, which is that's the problem we have at Amazon. Uh, we have 1.6 million employees, I think of them as 1.6 million research subjects, um, but uh, that are trying to, uh, they're cr creating new knowledge all the time and trying to keep upskilled with that knowledge. So the uh, traditional mechanisms of how you continuously upskill and build knowledge that's distributed across multiple people, it's not like there's a single expert and everybody has to just learn at the foot of that expert. That's not how knowledge is constructed anymore. So the old mechanisms don't work. So this is where the data collection uh, becomes really important because you can have uh, people doing essentially, I wouldn't call them experiments because they're not structured in that way, but maybe we could say structured observations. You create a context where people can engage in systematic structured observation where every time I try and design something or someone else tries to design something, we can collect the evidence about what worked and didn't work for that learner learning that thing in that context. And we just keep building up that knowledge base and start looking for patterns that then we can do structured experimentation to test. So that, I think, gets at your uh, question. Yes. And, and John, uh, there was actually a question that went to both of you about lifelong learning and yeah. adult learning. So Well, so I, I think we try to teach problem solving skills. We try to teach skills where students will be able to master, as Candace said, new information, especially in my field, in computer science. Yeah. What you learned 10 years ago is obsolete. It's obsolete. And if we trained you to be the best web programmer you could be today, five years from now, you couldn't learn something new, you wouldn't have a job. You'd be stuck, right? So we need to teach students so that they can master new things. They have some basic skills, they have some basic knowledge, but they can build on that, they can build on that, they can build on that. And they can do it in a way that's fearless, right? Because if they're afraid to go into a new field, they're going to be paralyzed in their careers. We tell our students now, 
your life is not one career anymore. It's going to be more than one career. You're going to be doing different things, not just different jobs, but different kinds of work over time, and we need to prepare you for that kind of learning. Great. I have a question uh, in the back here, and then, sir, you'll be next. So, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Glenn Fajardo. I teach at the Stanford D School. Uh, my question is a personal reflection question for the panel. Uh, what is one unexpected lesson you learned about learning during the pandemic? Maybe something that you hadn't fully totally considered, something that you hadn't thought about before. Oh, who'd like to take that personal lesson? I, I think large lectures actually online can work better in some strange ways. One of the things we discovered was that students were a lot more willing to ask questions. And sometimes in engineering classes where women are often outnumbered, they were more comfortable in an online setting asking questions and speaking up. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a positive thing about mm -hmm. that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Salt, what did you learn? No, I'll, I'll double down on that. Obviously, it's been really hard. You know, I, a, a lot of the shift from physical, we, we took a very passive seat time based system and then we just transplanted that to Zoom and then people were surprised that it was even less engaging uh, for, <laughs> for a lot of folks. Uh, but what, what, what John is referring to is, is, is exactly right, that when it has been done well, it's actually been incredibly powerful. Uh, there's this notion of, yeah, you see all the faces, et cetera. Uh, you know, there's tools that we're starting to use inside of Khan Academy where you can actually see how much different people are speaking. Uh, which is good feedback for you know, myself or others. If we're speaking too much or too little, who do you call on? Uh, on schoolhouse.world, we're starting to look at artificial intelligence that can actually look at the transcript as it's happening and help get coach the tutor to say, hey, you haven't called on this person. Here's an interesting example for you to work on. Um, we all saw the use of breakouts, which makes mm -hmm. the activity much more interactive, which is very hard to do in a, in a physical mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think, I think it, it, once again, it's never about technology, not technology. It's all about what's the use case, what's the pedagogy, what's the human interaction. Mm -hmm. And there were some that were, uh, that were strangely better. And, and you, what you, I, I would guess that there's more teachers trying to do physical breakouts now than there were pre-pandemic because they got used to it because of uh, the ability yeah. to do it. Yeah, okay. I would add, you know, in the, like, in the smaller settings where we're working to kind of apply the principles of learning science, doing that on Zoom just kind of emphasized how easy it is to disengage. Someone goes off camera, um, and also reinforced <laughs> how important trust and vulnerability and community is to learning. So, yeah. We also discovered students can multitask just as well <laughs> yes. online as they can in the classroom. That they can. <laughs> just as well. <laughs> Facebook they is there. <laughs> that they can. Yes, we did, oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go I was ahead. just to yes. say we, um, we uh, at Amazon still did a lot of classroom-based uh, training before the pandemic, and one of them was a, a course that everybody at the company was required to take on how to do interviewing. And one of the pieces of that was they would break people into triads to just practice interviewing and then someone observe and give feedback. Of course, the problem with that is you've got kind of someone who giving feedback who doesn't necessarily understand what it is that dyad practice is supposed to support. Mm -hmm. So in moving it to a completely uh, distributed remote learning experience, we had to think about how do we give that practice. And so one of the things we did, obviously because we're Amazon, was uh, create an Alexa skill where, where Alexa became the person being interviewed. So then um, when you were practicing, the learner was asking Alexa a question. Alexa could process the question and answer and then ask and then give another response. And we could collect all of those data and from those data infer what the uh, <laughs> learner was saying. And then we could, uh, we, we got a lot more insight into uh, where students uh, struggle in learning that particular skill and how to give feedback uh, to it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it's another example of the use of the technology allowing us to sort of diagnose and do research in a way we couldn't do before. Yes, yes sir, if you'll, if you'll um, identify yourself, please, yes. Um, Fred Singer, um, and thank you for the comments. You know, we're talking about a theory of change, but there's really this tension that we're not always bringing about, which is on one hand, you have the systems approach using technology scale. John, you talked about it, the Google loop every day, you've got to, you, you gather data, you make changes. And then on the other half, there's the craft of teaching. The, the teachers want to control the classroom because they want to be 
at the center of it, and, and those two are in conflict in, in reality. And how do you think about bridging those two where you get systems and real data every day in a classroom, we really don't have that much data nationally on what goes on in a classroom, with also allowing teachers to be teachers, build that learning environment we've talked about all day. So look, interest on how you bridge that, that gap. I'm listening. not owning all the gaps. So oh, right. yeah. <laughs> yes. um, I would say uh, you shift the role of the teacher, but not in the way that you're expecting, I'm going to say. Uh, what, we always talk about the gap between research and practice, and mostly what we mean by that is we researchers know a lot that those practitioners just aren't doing. Mm -hmm. um, but the gap is broken in the other direction. There are, we heard a lot of talk today about excellent teachers. Those are people who have built up practices and wisdom that don't find its way back into informing the research. So I make the argument that the research practice gap is broken in both directions. Mm -hmm. And the way you change that is you to engage the teachers as practitioners collaborating with us in building the expertise and knowledge we need to move everything forward. I think if you go to teachers and say, You're, you've been doing it wrong, you need to do it differently, do it this way, that's a losing, a losing, no matter how much evidence you bring, it's a losing argument. And I, I, I fully agree. And would add our, our dear friends in policy making are a huge piece of the puzzle too, because you know, Dean Schwartz put this incredible framework up this morning uh, around really what we're talking about is ter in terms of whole child development. Um, and you know, poli like accountability systems just haven't gotten that memo, right? So. You know, money flows uh, into areas that are incentivized by policy and accountability. And if test scores in math and literacy are what are named as success for a school, that's going to be reinforced. And so, um, and I, I'm very optimistic. I think we are moving in a direction around states, in particular, in particular, embracing a broader definition of success and kind of expanding what we even think of when we think of the diploma. Um, but they are the piece of the puzzle that kind of is going to help us um, kind of move to kind of a systems level of change. Yes, right here. Um, I'm Beth King. Um, I like very much and I agree very much with a point that was made that the pandemic is not the only disruption we're going to be experiencing. And what was mentioned was, you know, armed conflicts, um, natural disasters and so forth. So, so the pandemic is really a wake-up call mm -hmm. to the, the fact that there are many uh, instances when uh, schools are, uh, 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 school, schools are, dis are, are, are discontinued or, or disrupted. And uh, maybe not in the US, but certainly in the rest of the world, in many places in the world that suffer from these things. So you also mentioned that then, I think it was uh, Mr. Hennessy who mentioned that we should be prepared for these kinds of disruptions. So what are a few things that, we, that school systems need to do to be prepared for such disruptions so that when those disruptions happen, there's something, you know, the school systems go into gear to, to, to respond. And you mentioned, I think, um, Ms. Tillett, that, that, you know, that the health system does that. So how can the school systems do it? And please feel free to think about not just the university level, but also the uh, before university level. Candice, do you want to start? I, I feel like I've been talking about Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. But John? So I, I think if some things are crystal clear. Connectivity really matters, and I think having that connectivity. We also saw things, um, some of the kids in local school districts didn't have computers at home. So we had to get computers. Then you've got to solve all the supply chain problems, which became even more difficult uh, during pandemic. I think we're going to have to prepare our things. One of the things, even at the university level, we encountered a, a problem which I wouldn't have thought of at the beginning. Namely, some of our lower income students couldn't go home. They had no interconnectivity. They had no place where they could sit quietly in a room and watch a course because there were six people living in a three-room house. And so um, we ended up with a 
about 1,200 of our undergraduates living on campus during the pandemic so that we could support them, they could take classes, they could be engaged, and they could continue their education. They were the ones we were most worried about. We didn't have to worry about the, uh, the child who was at home with two parents who were college educated who would provide the opportunity to engage them. We had to worry about those, the kids who were more at risk in this situation. And I think it was the right thing to do and it, it worked out, but it required a real change in how the university thought about its role. Yeah. I would just say one thing that occurs to me too is uh, the role of the educator at home was highly variable. Uh, I had friends who uh, were teachers and were home with their kids. There were also parents who couldn't speak the language. And so uh, the role of that home educator probably needs to be thought through uh, more fully. Uh, I have a question all the way in the back. Yeah, um, my name is Rajan Sheth, and uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, impact of technology. And uh, John, you were saying about you know how at a place like Google you're able to iterate very quickly. Um, I spent a long time at Google and saw how you can do that. And now I'm in education and see how much harder it is uh, to do that. Um, a couple of questions on that. One is there are there ways to find early indicators of impact? that can let you iterate more quickly. And the second thing is you're talking about engagement and why engagement is so important. Should we be focusing in on engagement built on strong pedagogical uh, foundations um, as, opposed to, uh, as opposed to the pedagogical, uh, pedagogical foundations itself? And could that give us quicker impact for technology? John, Brooke? So, uh, you know, building on what Saul said about building up tutoring services, one of the experiments we did during COVID um, was the way we teach our undergraduate programming course, which is the largest course in the university. We teach it with undergraduate tutors that lead small working groups. So there's a big lecture. There's a lecture that has a thousand people in. They go to that lecture. It's really well prepared. It's a great learning opportunity. It's online as well. Uh, but then they work in small groups. So one of the things we asked is, could we export this model for all the kids who were trapped by COVID and were not able to take these courses, a, pr a program called Code in Place? So they did this experiment. They said, can we train 1,000 tutors to be, to be effective? And lo and behold, they got 1,000 people that had basic programming skills. They could pass a course. They could pass a test and train them as tutors for students around the world. And then using Zoom, you know, here you are, here's your little group of eight students, here's your tutor. Um, it worked amazingly well. So I think we can, we can be, when we're forced to create new ways of doing things where we can get data, we can really show this works. Absolutely. And there is a better way to do education. I think data is going to help set us free. It's going to be the cornerstone on which we do education reform as opposed to anecdotal education reform. It has to be driven by data. I'll sure. just add to that. It, 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 we're at an interesting transition point because uh, everyone in, let's call it ed tech or even non ed tech, the, you know, the, the, the things that are, but what's interesting about ed tech is that you have consistent interactions with the students that are for the most part standardized. And then we, we measure the efficacy of these things based on traditional standardized assessments that you know, ask the student like 50 questions once a year. And honestly, the student has no incentive to do well on them in, in many, many cases. And it's really the cart leading the horse. Because if you have a standardized mechanism where kids are able to work on it day in, day out, it's part of their practice, it's part of their learning, you actually have better data than the people who are doing the standardized assessment. You have more rigorous, psychometric, I mean, everything, you have a, a better data. So I think in the next five years, you're going to see that these snapshot assessments that you take once or twice a year, in many cases, high stakes, they're kind of silly. Um, when, you, when you could have day in, day out interactions, potentially hours with a student, uh, that in, in many ways are low stakes because if they're not there yet, they just keep working on it, but it's going to give much more nuance. So uh, you know, to, the, to the Google point, and many people in that tech, and we've been doing it, we've always been able to do A-B tests, which essentially mm -hmm. is a controlled experiment around engagement, around w search engine optimization, all the stuff that you know, Google and other uh, internet folks would do. But what we're really focused on right now is can we build our own internal learning metric that is actually more valid than the things that you get in a snapshot from one paper test you know, once a year. And then if you have that, you can start do a, you can do A-B testing on that, on what's actually leading to, to more learning. Okay. We yeah. also become better teachers this yeah. way because we discover 
you know what? All these learners out there didn't understand this core principle. Maybe there's something mm -hmm. wrong with that lecture. Maybe mm -hmm. there's something wrong with the material, and I think it, it can improve teaching. I wish well. somebody had done that for me with geometry. Uh, <laughs> yes, and, uh, I'm, we have three questions out there, and so I'm going to ask for brief responses to those, but uh, Candace, you wanted to, I'm sorry, uh, you wanted to say just a word, or are you going to? Me? Yes, didn't you? Oh, I wanted just to reinforce oh, no, the importance of having data. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, your your and, point, and yeah, so it was data. And so also the yes. importance of being able to interpret, interpret that data. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things people talk about all this exhaust we get from uh, technology mediated environments. And if it's just, if it's more noise than signal, it's mm. not that useful. Mm. So there's also the way that this is where design and science come together again, because we can design the learning environments so that they generate data that is actually interpretable and meaningful and not have to spend so much time trying to try and find the signal in the noise. Okay. We're getting close to the end of our time, so what I'm going to ask is that we take your questions and then we'll come back to the panel with the questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. My name is Dorothy Gordon, and I would like the panel to comment on the recent passing of the Age Appropriate by Design Act in California. And specifically, you know, it's addressing the fact that we have far more platforms providing education at all level. Platforms are collecting data on kids, selling it on to third parties, and nobody understands exactly where the data is going. So I'd like a comment on that. Right. Thank you. Yes. Hi, yes, my name is Shannon Burkibaha with the GSE Alumni Board. My question is, when thinking about how studying, how learning works, and how different learners learn best when using new technologies like big data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, how do you sure ensure that knowledge, skills, dispositions, and orientations that aren't necessarily quantifiable or as easily capturable at scale or maybe as reflective of, as, uh, as deep learning, like with the multiple choice test, how do you ensure that they're not uh, lost or deprioritized? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. My name is Ruth Kagia. Uh, Secretary Rice started by saying that we are on the cusp of a major scientific uh, revolution. But listening to all of you, it seems like that revolution lies on the margin of a contradiction. Vicky saying that the sources of innovation and energy is emerging from the margins of society. The question is to what extent are we sufficiently focusing on the margins of society to look for innovation? The computer scientists talking about how what you teach today is going to be relevant five years from now. How do you ensure that what you teach is sufficiently versatile to adapt to changing realities? And then, for me, you know, something that really resonated uh, with me from the lady at the end, which is that human interaction is by nature multisectoral, but education is by definition uh, unisectoral. And that sort of brought back concerns I had about the panel before this one on early childhood development, which is of necessity multisectoral from, pre from pregnancy right through the first 1,000 days when it's not purely an education process, but it involves health, it involves the community, and so on. So again, to what extent, as we look at the theory of change, as we look at promoting learning, are we focusing on that multisectorality? So my question is, as we look at the theory of change, as we look at energizing uh, uh, the, the learning potential for kids, it almost seems like we need to look at that inherent tension in learning in order to see the change. And yet all the examples we've been talking about today are normative. They are looking at sort of what we have always known. So how do we manage that contradiction in order to really get to that delta that brings about a real revolution that the Secretary talked about. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so let's go to the first question. Um, this is about the 
uh, age-appropriate platform, California. John, I'm sure you're familiar with this, given your uh, perspective. Yeah, so California has the strongest uh, data privacy rules in the country, and particularly around children, even stronger. And I think th those are vital. And it's, it, it, the, the key challenge is going to be that ensuring that our systems can, our, our civic systems can monitor and enforce these rules. Because th there are unfortunately bad actors in the world and I think we're gonna have to be on our toes, which means parents need to be better educated too with respect to what their children are using and how they're engaging. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there's su sufficient understanding of that not in California law, but uh, in the platforms themselves. Well, there's not sufficient understanding <laughs> by the user community of the platform, for sure, right? And, um, and that, that's going to be an ongoing educational process. One of the challenges I think the tech sector has had is if I put out all the different bells and whistles you could use to control how data is used, you, you won't even finish filling in the boxes to say which ones you want and which ones you don't want. So we need to find simpler ways to deal with issues of privacy and how people, uh, how information is used, and I think that's going to be critical going forward. Yeah, uh, before, yeah. when I was at Stanford, before I went to Amazon, we were uh, making a big push to define new standards for responsible use of mm -hmm. learner data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, that doesn't just mean privacy. It means how do you, uh, how do you maximize the use of the data for scientific discovery and for the benefit of society while minimizing the potential harm to any individual? And then to the second question, and, and Sal, I'm gonna go back to you on this one, the question of what is quantifiable. You talked a little bit about the once a year, high stakes test, uh, multiple choice. Uh, how do we think about uh, assessment in uh, perhaps tacking on to what you said earlier? Yeah, what's interesting about where we are now, I mean, the, the question I think could be taken two ways. One is, are we going to get, you know, we, we are already had things like multiple choice exams because those were machine gradable, and so they, it, it helped us do things. Um, and, and you can actually get pretty good stuff from multiple choice data, but I think what's exciting about the world we're in now is, uh, you know, some, some, of, some of both on the artificial intelligence side or leveraging technology to actually get peer-to-peer -peer human interaction can start to standardize assessment of the things that were formerly unmeasurable. So for example, we're uh, uh, doing a, a little bit of a research project that I hope we can actually uh, bring, bring, bring to the world in, in the next six to 12 months, which is at, at Wharton University, uh, uh, Wharton School of Business, I should say, they, they had a, uh, they, they've been doing this for seven years. They have a paper, there's a rubric, the students uh, do the paper, they submit it, and they have their own homebrew system that just, the, the, the professor just grades five of the papers, and then every student there gets five random papers, they stack rank them, the mm -hmm. algorithm mm -hmm. keeps operating. Students are graded not just on what their grade on their paper is, but how well they grade other students. So it's an interesting iterative algorithm. Um, things like that should be mainstream. And they speak to, you know, going to the earlier question, is how do you get over the teacher inertia, which is a real thing. You have to speak to, wow, they're already spending all night grading papers, et cetera, et cetera. And every teacher who's worked with this type of a system said, wow, not only does this save me grading papers, it actually helps the kids learn to write better because they're able to look at different levels of writing, they're thinking about the rubric, they're able to iterate on it, it can help support mastery learning. That's one of the, 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 the limits is like, hey, how do you get to do something over and over where the, the teacher has to keep grading it? So I, I hope that we can uh, leverage both things like artificial intelligence, probably in conjunction with human peer-to-peer -peer systems mm -hmm. to, to actually mm -hmm. really broaden what we could, um, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no standardized assessment today for how creative you are, how funny you are. I think we, we could start getting to okay. some interesting things there. I'm gonna use the last question to pose a very brief question to each of you, which is uh, as the uh, questioner asked about, you know, how do we make sure that this time we don't miss the moment uh, for marginalized populations, but in general, for science to really transform. If we're sitting here 10 years from now, uh, what is the one thing that you would say to people, do it tomorrow, so that 10 years from now, this conversation is different about education? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm gonna start with you, Brooke. Sure. Um, I think I would say, just ev like every single person in this room and, and online, like just reject this false dichotomy that there's academic rigor and then other parts of how we support children, whether it's relationship, uh, well-being, um, connection. Uh, 
again, they're integrated in the human being. And if we can uh, reframe education as holistic human development and recognize academic rigor as a piece of it, um, I think we'll, we'll move the system. Saul? Oh, I, um, we should create or uh, you know, collaboratively pre-K through career, competency-based, uh, free or near free, hyper accessible system that anyone can engage in and all of the supports you need to be able to do it. And then that collapses the problem to how do we get people to engage? And then we should have models for how that engagement can be done in a cost effective and uh, a reasonable way. Yeah. Vicki. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> What's the one thing one that thing you want do. us to okay. do tomorrow so Perfect. that 10 years from now we're not having the same well, conversation? Well, there has been a pedagogical uh, change in the learning paradigm. I mean, that's so important. But to do that, uh, you have to have good data. I mean, Escuela Nueva has been sustained so long because, you know, here we always come and, and, and bring statistics and show results. That's crucial. That's crucial for learning. And um, technology can trigger change, but it's not enough. You need a pedagogical change. I mean, when you say all these ideas, we've known these ideas for so many years. And why? Don't education systems change? I, I, I'm going to say something that I know um, Mr. Charles Hughes likes very much is, you know, if you bring a doctor into a health system today, you know, that, that from a, if you bring a doctor from 100 years ago into hospital today or to the health sector, that doctor is lost because everything has changed. But if you bring, <laughs> if you bring, uh, uh, not, not, not a, if, if you bring a, uh, a teacher um, from 100 years ago, you know, uh, it's totally different. It's totally different. Okay. So, so I think that's a, that that's a, a learning a paradigm change. should be Thank changed. You. Yes. John? That's a good question, Condi. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, a simple observation. There are great schools everywhere. There are great schools in rural areas. There are great schools in inner cities. There are great schools in poor neighborhoods. There are great schools in rich neighborhoods. Why can't we figure out what makes those schools successful and ensure that the best practices are in every single school? You know, the, the great challenge we have in the US is we think all citizens are entitled to certain things and a great education should be part of what every citizen in the United States gets. Okay. So I guess I would say change the relationship between research and practice, mm -hmm. and uh, think of learning research as a design science. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, uh, since that is your writ, uh, <laughs> Dean Schwartz, mm -hmm. but thank you very much. Will you join me in thanking our panelists for a really great discussion? That was just an amazing panel. Thank you all so much. Um, and uh, now I would like to invite Dean Schwartz up uh, to join me for the finale of our day. <laughs>